busy schedules to join us for today's Field Brief Advice 10, or as we here at Oshpaw refer to it as FBA 10. Today, we're going to be going over the test inspection and observation program and how to fill it out. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to download today's presentation provided for you in PDF format in the handout section of the GoTo panel. Um, so go ahead and do that now while we're doing the uh, housekeeping items. And if you haven't been to one of these before, you know that uh, typically we're here for a 10 minute presentation and a 15 to 20 minute question and answer at the end of the presentation. Please know that you will all be muted during your, the presentation, but you'll also have the opportunity to type your questions into the GoTo panel uh, question box uh, and ask your question where we'll have some of the team members, Oshpa team members here kind of monitoring those questions and we'll get to those questions at the end. You will also have the opportunity to raise your hand uh, and participate in an open dialogue format uh, Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you can, raise your hand and we will on you at the end of the presentation. We will unmute you and then you can unmute yourself and you'll have the opportunity to, to, to voice your opinion, share some, some experiences or ask a question. Please keep your questions generic. Uh, specific to this presentation, but if you do have a specific question about something else, about a specific project or a specific issue, feel free to email us at oshpd.fddisu at oshpod.ca.gov. Again, that's oshpd.fddisu at oshpod.ca.gov. And if we experience transmission difficulties, please feel free to log off log back in using the same login information that the GoTo software sent you, and we will do the same if we have the uh, technical issues on our end. So for today, uh, I will be the presenter for today's presentation, and we will have the rest of the ISU team in the background answering some of those questions and the, and the uh, typed in questions and being able to call on you at the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we will get to those and uh, be able to uh, answer those. So with that being said, let me switch gears here. I'm going to go and switch screens and um, we will be able to begin the presentation. So TIO program, why do we need it? The, the, which is one of the first questions, uh, important question, mind you. Um, we need it because a TIO program is required by the California Administrative Code, Section 7-1141. But it's also a helpful tool to identify important items and ensure facilities are built to the approved construction documents. Who is responsible? The design professional of record and is responsible for the TIO. The architect and or structural engineer delegates and alternates as well. But remember that the TIO is not the responsibility of the IOR the special inspector or the contractors on site. What does the TIO contain? It contains project information. It contains tests, manner and frequencies for the, the specific test. And it also identifies material samples of test and inspection reports, special inspections, VCRs or verified compliance reports, testing agencies. It identifies the California energy compliance forms, which we'll get into in a little bit. It identifies the IOR or IORs on the job and the milestones, which is which is again identified uh, or verified by the verified compliance reports or VCR. It has summary of changes as well. So where is it uh, reviewed and used? It's reviewed in plan review and it's used on site and off site uh, during during off site manu manufacturing facilities for off site construction. When is it referenced? It's uh, submitted to the OSHPOD for plan review. It's reviewed by OSHPOD field staff and approved in the field uh, prior to construction. As a base, best practice, it should be provided with a notice of start of construction and make and remember that all changes to the TIO shall be submitted to OSHPOD for review uh, and approval. Section A. Section A provides basic information, facility number, facility name, address, etc. This section also now clearly identifies that it's the DPOR's responsibility to administer the work of construction, including and maintaining the TIO. 
It also notifies the DPOR that the TIO will be reviewed for scope of work during plan review, but not approved. The TIO program approval will be issued by OSHPOD field staff. Remember that. The TIO program approval needs to be submitted, uh, needs to be obtained, I'm sorry, before construction and included, uh, should be included in the notice of construction as well. And this also drives a point home that the construction shall not commence until written approval of the TIO program is issued by OSHPA. Section B, C, and D, tests and special inspections. In this box here, the DPOR identifies the required test for the project. The DPOR typically has in-depth knowledge of the project. And that's why it's the DPOR's responsibility to identify the required tests and inspections required before submitting the TIO program for review and approval. And these boxes here, the DPOR identifies uh, if samples of tests and inspection reports will be submitted for a specific test or if OSHPROD's pre-approval agency uh, or OPAA as we refer to it will be used. Remember, if the DPOR selects the OPAA box, no samples of tests and inspection reports will be required for that specific test, but there's one catch. The OPAA program will only uh, apply structural um, it's not others like penetrated rated assemblies, AKA fire stopping. In this box here, the IOR identifies the responsible agency and or individual who will be performing the test and inspections. This box here, the IOR indicates concurrence with the work of construction. If the inspection is performed by a special inspection agency, it is the IOR's responsibility to review the special inspection report to make sure that the work passed inspection. In this box here, OSHPROD field staff will go ahead and initial and date this box only when they verify that the specific test is completed and all special inspection reports, IOR daily reports, and or VCRs have been recorded are part of the IOR daily record and show that this work is now completed. These boxes here, B and C uh, is the same, but C is for uh, special inspections on site and D is for special inspections off site. But also remember that it's it's the same thing as Section B for identifying the test, uh, whether the OPA program is going to be used, and et cetera. Section E is uh, required compliance forms. This is a newer re a requirement found in the California Administrative Code, Section 7-118. Uh, this box here identifies uh, it's required by the code and it's required to have that DPOR identify all non-residential forms required for the project. This next box here, in this box, the responsible designer or installing contractor signs uh, to indicate their concurrence that all the work construction has been completed per the approved construction documents. On the documents, the field, on the actual documents, the CEC documents, the field tech or installer signs the installation certificate and the installing contractor or the installer's boss signs the certificate of acceptance and the attest that the construction or installation identified on their certificate of acceptance complies with the applicable acceptance requirements indicated in the plans and specifications approved by OSHPOD. For more information, feel free to visit the California Energy Commission website at www.e nergy.ca.gov or www.energy.ca.gov. And in the search box, once you get to the website, type in the non-residential compliance forms a term or terms, and you'll and it'll take you to the links where those those actual forms are located. In this next box here, similar to tabs B, C, and D, the IOR is required to review the non-residential installation certificates and make sure that the installer and installing contractor have verified the installation complies with the applicable acceptance requirements and the approved construction documents. If the report indicates all work complies, then the IOR initials and dates this box. Upon completion of all required forms in this box, at least one OSHPOD field staff, compliance officer, fire life safety officer, or district structural engineer will review for compliance with the approved construction documents and the TIO program and indicate their concurrence with an initial and date in that box. Section F, Verified con Construction Report. In this section here, it also identifies that those completing the TIO per the California Administrative Code uh, must verify that the work during the period or 
The work of construction covered by the report has been performed and materials used and installed are in accordance with the construction documents. VCRs or verified compliance reports shall be submitted to the office at intervals or stages of the work as stated in, in this section here. In this box here, the DPOR is responsible for identifying all milestones for the boxes. These milestones are required to be documented with VCR again or verified compliance report. Code for the administrative as the project progresses. This TIO form is unlocked or a version of it is unlocked and provided on Oshpod's website and may be modified to address those added milestones in the or the DPR may use their own form. Again, as a reminder, the, the TIO form that is provided for you on Oshpod's website is just as a simple tool. It's always uh, up to the DPOR to use their own uh, test inspection and observation program and format. Section here, the v it also kind of drives the point home that uh, VC required to be completed by each responsible individual, ER or the record, protective record, or mechanical. Yes, sir. B and D, Oshpod field staff will initial and signify their concurrence that the VCR meets the code and reflects the work described in the approved construction documents. Section G, inspector of record responsibilities. This section is only required uh, if there's going to be more than one IOR on the job. It's required by the California Administrative Code, um, and it says if a project has more than one inspector of record, the distribution of responsibilities for the work shall be clearly identified for each IOR. This section uh, may be used here for if you have a large project, if you have phased a project with, with a lot of phases or more than one phase, or has specialty inspections or has offsite construction, et cetera. This section here, section H, Oshbod review, or this is for the plan review section of the test inspection and observation program. This section requires that the DPOR's signature to indicate that they have thoroughly reviewed the TIO and identified all the tests, special inspection, and milestones required for the project. This section is also required for Oshawa plan review staff, um, and they'll sign it. And by having the Oshawa plan review staff attend, they have provided an initial review of the TIO and that the items identified by the DPO are, are there and identified properly. We hear that Oshpod plan review staff will not approve the TIO program at this point. They will remark reviewed or reviewed with comments. The TIO program approval will be by the Oshpod field staff on the next tab. So what's the next step? We go to field staff approval. I, building permit approval. This section, the DPOR is required to sign and by signing the DPOR understands that they are required to and shall provide all tests and special inspection reports to the IOR and the owner. They are also attesting that all the VCRs will be signed by the individual who witnessed the completion of the work construction documents, and the report will state clearly if the tests or special inspections were in accordance with the Oshpot approved construction docs. They also certify that the DPOR has identified on sheets B, C, and D if they are providing samples of tests of inspections or they're using the OPA program only. Oshbod field staff signature here, and they will indicate whether they're approving the TIO program or they're approving with comments. Remember, remember that the that no construction shall begin prior to the approval of the TIO program, and the the TIO program approval um, as best best practices should be submitted with a notice of start of construction to to the office or Oshpod. Subsequent approvals will be required for additional tests and inspections. So, on a side note, just remember that the TIO program will evolve as construction progresses, and the signature on this this initial sheet only signifies the initial approval of the TIO program. And subsequent approvals will be required for additional tests and inspections after the completion of the work. This section here is a section J summary of changes. It, it provides a, a section for a revision number to the uh, actual uh, project. 
It also provides a uh, section to, to allow for a brief description of the changes. And it also requires uh, the architect of record, engineer of record, or structural engineer of record signature to um, indicate that that's, that's who's directing the work and directing the change. It also has a box for the date of the effective changes. And again, just like the other tabs, B, C, and D, um, a section for Oshbot concurrence in this box here. And this here is uh, flow charts. It's a new section to the TIO. It provides an ideal flow of the TIO, and it also provides the associated code sections uh, that are responsible within every single uh, section of that TIO. Uh, this flow chart was added out of requests from different stakeholders who wanted a graphic representation of an ideal TIO program and its evolution through the construction progress. Um, and that there is, in a nutshell, the presentation. So if I can ask those who are interested in participating in an open dialogue, please raise your hand and we'll go ahead and call on you um, if you have some questions or if we have some questions, we can go ahead and respond to those in uh, the text format. So we're going through the list of names and I don't see any hands raised uh, so far, so I'm going to go ahead and encourage you to do so if you'd like to participate in an open discussion, if you have questions, or if it's, uh, if it's clear as mud, uh, please let us know as well. So, Gabe, I do see you have your hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute you if you'd like to unmute yourself, Gabe. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question on the TIO about... Uh, Special inspections by IORs. In Chapter 17, there are a couple sections that call out um, special inspections on non-structural elements, um, non-structural framing, and ar some architectural features. Um, is an IOR report, um, an inspection report, or a daily report enough to um, meet those requirements, or are you expecting an IOR to create a special inspection report that says special inspection. Um, and I'm wondering, I've got some pushback from some of the IORs or some questions um, because we, there are potentially some liability or insurance issues because what it takes to be a special inspector, there's a lot of regulations on what that requires also. So um, they feel that they may not be um, the right person to be doing a special inspection report on some of these, but it's it's normally things that the IORs look at. Great, uh, thank thanks for the question, Gabe. That's a great question, James. If you're there, I think I think you can provide a, a, a an awesome answer to Gabe's question, James. If you're there, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, this is uh, DAC uh, James Pond uh, from ISU. Uh, to answer Gabe, your question that. Yes, a separate spatial inspection report is required because 1704A.2.4, they are, you know, building code requirements on what it needs to be stated in the spatial inspection report, right? So those statements need to be included in the report and the spatial inspection report has to be more detailed than the typical IOWAS daily records because in regulation, the IOWAS daily record, you just need to provide a summary of the day or a portion of the day, right? But spatial inspection report has to be very detailed on what the person inspect and if the inspection pass or fail, the inspection and if the inspection is per the approved construction documents or not. So those information need to, need to be included. And if the field staff allow you to combine the spatial inspection report and the IOR's daily records that need to be agreed upon prior to start of the project, because typically IOR's are not spatial inspectors, right? You need to be approved for the project to be the special inspectors. So you are not automatically uh, be the special inspector for all the uh, items noted on the TIO form. So that need to be uh, discussed with the field staff and at times it might need to be discussed with the RCO because that will change your workload, right? So that might 
affect your IOWAS performance and your duties if you are the special inspectors too for uh, for the projects. So typically, you know, you, you might be approved a for small projects, remodel projects, but definitely not a new grown up projects that you are both the special inspector and then the IOWA. Which, right, I guess I'm not, not specifically talking about anchors or pulling some ceiling wires. I'm talking about uh, non-structural uh, framing. There's a requirement for it says a special inspection report um, for framing, and it's not it's not specific to welding or anchors. Um, I, their special inspectors wouldn't even know what to look at for framing. Um, you know, as for framing installation, uh, that's that's what the IORs look at, and so what you're saying is, and, and I, would, I would disagree with that, right? Because that's not what uh, Auspot amended the chapters too right it's actually model code and it's just that lady people finally realize framing ceiling and whatnot all those non-structural structural components are actually spatial inspections so just like in the old days right uh you know nothing was spatial inspection and more and more items now due to mo model code language changes those items become spatial inspections now so, you know, even spatial seismic certification, that ID and the installation of uh, components, equipment and system that requires spatial seismic certification, that is a spatial inspection now, right? But I see most of the project, that duty is still assigned to the IOR. So as far as for if the IOWAS, uh, you know, our missions and liability insurance cover that or not, uh, that's not for us part to decide. However, the report language needs to be meeting the building code requirements. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, because I think your question kind of started from there are some verbiage in the building code that prohibit the IOWAS to conduct that. And if that's the case, then the IOR shouldn't be conducting special inspection for those uh, systems or components. Great, thanks. Thanks for the question, Gabe. Um, okay. Jamie, we see that we have your hand that you have your hand up. So I'm going to go ahead um, and unmute you. Jamie, are you there? Yeah, I can hear. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. So. I usually struggle with the TIO, you know, get, I get the whole process started. A lot of it is pretty boilerplate information, but where I, I always get a struggle with is designating tests that are required. And so I do my best by reaching out to my engineers and kind of huddling up on figuring out what to put. Then it goes in for review and approval, in, in, you know, at the state. And um, they might add a, a couple items. And then it gets approved, as you mentioned, but then we got to get field approved. So now, um, for example, on a project I have right now, um, being told to double check it before we send it to the ACO for final approval. Um, I'm not sure what to check for at this point. And so, you know, I usually ask my IOR and contractor any last thoughts, otherwise I'm gonna issue it. I feel like there's a, a disconnect on how much information needs to go on there. And, you know, as a DPOR, and I've been doing this for 15 years, I just don't know everything. And so it's kind of overwhelming. And then because the whole presentation is, oh, it's the DPOR's responsibility. But I feel like this form is really team populated. Uh, you know, DPR is more like shepherding the information, if, if you will. So I don't know if there's a better way to do this, but I find it always kind of a handful to fill out or to get to the finish line. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Jamie. And and you're right. It is it is the DPOR's responsibility, and that's you know that's identified in the administrative code. But um, it's a great idea to to huddle with your design team. Um, even you might you might even want to have a pre-construction meeting and to address you know some of these items. But the, to to answer your question and to kind of clarify your statement. The, the TIO, when it's submitted to Oshpod for review and it's, and it's sent back to you, it's, it's, not, it's not approved. Um, it's, it's merely reviewed and, and they'll, 
the, the OSHPOD plan review team will go ahead and issue comments and um, suggestions as to which test you 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 um, you know missed, and they'll put them on the um, on that TIO. The the field staff or the ACO um, RCO, uh, excuse me, and James, feel free to jump in and, and Monica as well. Um, will go ahead, the RCO will go ahead and review the TIO, and then the RCO will issue that approval once all those uh, tests and, uh, have been identified. But as far as it being a collaborative effort, you're right. It's, you know, it's, it's not something that, uh, it, it requ it's something that requires a lot of uh, think tank and conversation, um, but also it's, uh, it's up to you as a DPOR to identify those um, those specific tests. And James, I don't know if there's something that I missed or Monica, something that I missed, you, you might want to add to that. This is Monica. Yeah, and Jim, yeah uh, go ahead, Monica. Uh, very shortly. So yes, I'm reinforcing what Cesar is saying. As a DPOR, as a project manager, um, the, the DPOR needs to coordinate with the rest of the designers. And there is a, a, a live coordination with everybody, every discipline and going through together about the TIO is not just one designer, is not just the PM by himself or herself, but it is a teamwork all together to figure it out which are the tests to be included in the TIO. Yeah, and James, uh, and, 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 this is James, you know, uh, I was part this is the voluntary forms that we are providing to the industry. And I assure have spent a lot of times, and it's not perfect. We, we recently, we just uh, found out that due to the, uh, the new code uh, changes, there's one mechanical test that we did not add to the TIO form. So yes, it is a, it's a good effort. And this form is a living document, right? We constantly change during construction because, you know, when you submit for a plan review, everything is TVD. However, the scope of inspection and test should be marked. And, and that's why we are seeing that the DPOR are not doing the job on checking the required tests and special inspections. And if you read each nine items that we provided, on, on the bottom of that Pacific test or special inspection is the reference to the code that require that test or special inspection. So that's where we, we want everybody to, you know, study a little bit and, and read the forms and prepare a comprehensive and complete form um, to submit to OSHPAR for plan review and the field staff will provide concurrence and approval when the, um, I guess proposed individual and firms are selected prior to that specific night items to start. So you don't have to complete everything, but prior to start of that specific work, the individual or the firm need to be identified and be approved by the field staff. So that's the that's the key that we want to uh, present to the uh, to the industry. Thanks, James, and that's and then, that's great. Like another example of kind of a team effort is when I submit for initial review, we may or may not list the testing agencies. And as an architect, frankly, unless I've worked with one hospital for 10 years, I don't even know who they are. So we need help from the hospital. So it seems like typically that piece of information gets incorporated before the ACO proves it. So after review by the DN House, but before the ACO approves the actual CIO. And yeah, I need help. I need help. That's absolutely correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. James, and if I can kind of uh, interject real quick, we do have one minute left. In, uh, after, so if you, uh, if you would like to stick around and, and uh, participate in the discussion, you're more than welcome to. I do see, John, you have your hand up, and Robert, um, you still have your hand up. So uh, we're going to call on you in just a sec, but just want to let you guys know that we have one minute, one minute left, but you're more than welcome to stick around and listen to the rest of the conversation. Go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, and, and that's what uh, Cesar mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, right? We, we're going to change the philosophy that when doing plan review, uh, it will be just reviewed for the content of the test and special inspection required for the project. It's not approved until the field staff approve it. 
because ninety nine percent of the TIO that we receive during plan review, uh, they are TBDs, right? Because the uh, the contract has not been awarded yet, so we understand that the DPOs do not know who the individuals or the firms will be uh, will be used. So that's why it's a living document, and now uh, in the future, you will see a review stamp uh, be used for the TIO when it's so-called reviewed during plan review, and then it will be formally approved during construction by the field staff. Oh, that makes sense. I didn't realize that was going to change. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. John, I see you have your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to unmute yourself. John? Okay, first of all, I just, again, want to thank all you guys for putting it together. Uh, it's a great help to all of us. My question, uh, it kind of goes back to the former person's question. Um, if somebody is on the TIO as a, a special inspector, uh, let's say a welding inspector. However, they take the Oshpod test, they progress, they end up getting a license, and they become the IOR or one of the IORs on a project. Would there be any issue if they still worked for the lab and did inspections, let's say a welding inspection for one day on the project, even though they are actually one of either the IOR or one of the approved IORs for the project as well? In other well, words, they're, ahead. they're approved on both fronts as a special inspector and as a, an IOR with an application on the project. So the the individual could be you know correct me if I'm wrong James the individual that indiv specific individual who began as a special inspector and then later became uh, certified as an IOR would still have to be approved by the a uh, the RCO for to be an IOR on the project um, if there was if that individual uh, was able to provide separate uh, reports a report for the IOR as a daily report and special inspections, um, there would be uh, no issue, right, James? That's correct. The, the key is the person can wear two hats, however, has to be approved by our part. So like I say, for small projects, I can see the individual to do both uh, duties, but on large tower project, uh, it will be unlikely unless the IOR now for doing that, say for structural steel welding, want to be the special inspector and are only doing that specific nine items. And the IOR metrics is clearly identified. And, and our TIO form, we does provide a IOR metrics, right? Uh, it's one of the sections that you can fill out if you have multiple IORs. However, for large, uh, uh, going up new tower project, I just don't see the IOR could be the spatial inspector to conduct structural welding and other spatial inspections because there's too much uh, IOR's duty that the person is supposed to be inspecting everything for the tower and unable to inspect, you know, other spatial inspections that are required because many spatial re uh, inspections require continual inspection, which means that you cannot leave that area while other trades are doing other work that you are required to inspect other work. So I don't know if that clarify your questions or not. Yeah, I, I understand. And yeah, this particular situation is a uh, remodel type project. So that's, I don't think that would apply. But yeah, I just wonder if that circumstance was actually, if there's any Oshpod problem with that um, because they'd sort of shifted roles. Um, just, just a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and you're correct. On, on most of our uh, remodel project, we have the IORs being approved as the special inspector for uh, for the uh, installation of the uh, post-installed concrete anchors. So that's you know commonly done, and uh, you know suspended ceilings and whatnot. Those are all IORs are doing it for those special inspection tasks. Yeah, actually, I was curious about that in a in a job where. The TIO shows the lab listed for that type of thing. And then the IOR kind of takes it upon themselves to do that as well. Is that appropriate? Uh, no, because uh, the DPOR needs to select that first 
and uh, inform the ours portfolio staff and have ours portfolio staff concur that the IO was now is going to do that specific uh, spatial inspections. So the IOR could not just put himself or herself as the person to do that when it was previously a pool that the laboratory or the spatial inspection agency was going to conduct that work. So that's not appropriate to do that. And, and that change needs to be coming from the designer and be approved by our portfolio staff. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I was pretty certain of that. Although I've I've seen it happen, uh, and and I when it when I did, I was really surprised. Uh, I I didn't uh, push too hard, but I did. <laughs> and, and you are the DPOR, or you are the owner. Uh, actually, no, it's the lab. Oh, okay. I I run the lab. Great, thanks, John. Uh, great question. Uh, great discussion, by the way. Robert, we have we we see you have your hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Robert. All right. Um, <clears throat> looks like uh, Robert uh, put his hand down, so that's that's okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to go through the list of names one more time to see if anyone else has a question or has a follow-up question or maybe wants to uh, go ahead and share their experience. Uh, Robert, go ahead and uh, I see you have your hand up again. Go ahead and unmute yourself as we unmuted you, Robert. Okay. Um, maybe can I you hear me something. now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead, Apologize Robert. For Apologize for the confusion. This is my first time ever in which I performed the exercise of asking a question and I wasn't able to uh, navigate <laughs> about how to unmute myself. Uh, going over uh, the session, I apologize, but I had a question specific to the presenter when uh, he presented various parts of the TIO program, and I think it was towards the end where there was a section, and I'm kind of paraphrasing because it went by me rather quickly, was uh, a synopsis uh, of the changes. And, and the title above uh, that section was uh, something about non-materially altered changes. And uh, my, my question is, and that's why I'm asking the question that I am, is that change no, it wasn't. So, oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in terms of providing a synopsis of a change, uh, and it's the type of change that is non-materially altered, that's a little new to me because my opinion was, or what I thought was, uh, only changes to the work that were materially altered, uh, and uh, if such materially altered a change to any part of any work, the DPOR and uh, OSHPOD would have to officially review for approval that materially altered change and as such a change order would be provided. Uh, I'm trying to understand the logic of what significance to especially the authority having jurisdiction would any non-materially altered changes uh, be provided in a synopsis of the change in a TIO program. Is my question vague? Uh, well, your question is, is straightforward, but there's, there's several portions uh, to the answer, uh, to, uh, for the answer to your question. So when, when a change is non-material, um, it, it, should be identified, but it also still requires, it, it may not require uh, documentation to be submitted to the office for review, but it still requires field concurrence that the change is non-material. This is, um, if I may add something. Go ahead, Monica. Uh, so the admin code, the 7153, uh, provides the changes of the work and that includes material and non-material. So if you go to the code 7153 and you go toward the end 
of this portion of the cone, uh, identified that also what is non-material change needs to be stamped and signed. So it needs to be validated anyway that there is a change. And so that one needs to be tracked because it's okay. changing anyway the construction. St 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 stamped and, and signed. And, and that would be by either one or both, the DPOR and OSHPOD, or certainly uh, OSHPOD when you say stamped and signed. Pardon me? DPOR. Okay. All right. Yeah, and, and, and that's why on this section that we have a column that the DPOR, either the AOR or the ACOR need to uh, sign, right? You see that middle column, okay. architect, engineer, or record signature. And, and that's when you make change, and this change could be a non-material change or material change, right? But either one, if it's a change, the DPOR needs to sign it. Right. I, I haven't been actively engaged uh, in uh, actual assignment as an IOR for a number of years, so I appreciate your explanation on that matter. Uh, what uh, I always thought was a good practice on some of the jobs to which I was assigned uh, uh, we would arrange, when I say we, uh, as a consensus, uh, all of uh, us, whether the IOR, the DPOR, and any of uh, the consultants, including uh, contractors. When a contractor would, I'm just giving you an example, I know we're pressed for time, but as quickly as I'm able. Even RFIs, if an RFI went in to, to the uh, engineer or architect of record uh, asking for clarification, and uh, in the response to the nature and extent of that RFI, the arrangement we had on a job was that the DPOR was obliged to include in every one of the IORs, I mean the RFIs, excuse me, a statement of which uh, said that in his or her opinion, uh, the nature and extent of that RFI did not materially alter uh, any part of the construction, and therefore a change order was not uh, required. And what I would do as a responsible IOR when the uh, ACO on uh, his or her uh, job visit, uh, I would go over uh, all of those IO, all of those RFIs, these acronyms, uh, with the uh, uh, ACO, and, and then the ACO. Uh, would decide whether or not when the DPOR made the statement that he did, that the RFI, uh, in his opinion, did not materially alter the construction. And there were events, uh, and I would say they were rare, but uh, indeed the ACO, representing, of course, the authority of jurisdic uh, having jurisdiction, did not agree with that statement that it did not materially alter. So it was always a good practice. Uh, to, I found it very effective uh, to uh, develop an understanding or consensus what was materially altered or not. I th thank you for your explanation. And if I may quickly, as I heard some of the dialogue about uh, IORs performing uh, uh, work of which by the nature of the work was assigned to a special inspector, generally speaking, uh, it would be that if uh, the IOR, he or she, had the time available to them and providing they were uh, qualified to perform the in inspection subject to OSHPOD's approval, that that would happen. But on a limited basis, I think what Mr. Pan explained about as clear as anybody could, uh, special inspection, the nature of special inspection require requiring almost constant uh, observation or inspection of the work for which the special inspector is assigned would preclude an IOR, whether there were multiple IORs on the job or not, uh, to perform that kind of duty. The classic example is well, any example is uh, welding or placing concrete. Uh, I can't uh, fathom, even on a job, you know, granted, especially projects of some scope or magnitude, I can't see on any circumstance where an IOR uh, qualified or not would be able to uh, 
play those or perform those dual, dual roles as a special inspector and a IOR concurrently. It uh, doesn't meet the code. Uh, anyway, I appreciate, sorry for the uh, confusion on uh, getting in to uh, uh, ask you for the answer to the question I did and also for the ancillary uh, comments and remarks I made. I thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you for the comments, and and thank you for joining us, Robert. Uh, your your uh, your input is is valued for sure, and and everyone's input and experiences are valued as well. We have one last question we're going to get to. We're we're right out of time, um, and uh, those who uh, didn't get a chance to call on, feel free to email us at oshpd.fddisu at oshpd.ca.gov. So, Tim, this will be the last question. If you're still there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm still here. Uh, go ahead, Tim. I wanted to comment about, hi guys, uh, just a comment about uh, getting that uh, last minute uh, uh, input from team contractors. The contractor, one, one thing that I've noticed in my career from the contractor side is phasing and milestones typically are very far off. Um, from what a design team proposes to what a contractor may be able to do or what makes sense. So having that input to add additional phasing slash milestones when VCRs are going to be needed, um, how things are going to you know, start and stop on a project is obviously uh, pertinent information before an RCO through your field staff approves the TIO. Yes, this is James. And, and, uh, yeah, this is James, and thank you, Tim. You know that's why I always suggest or recommend a pre-construction meeting because the contractor detect the schedule. However, the functionality and the service function of this particular project is by the DPOR and Arch part, right? So there are some requirements that need to be met, even though your phasing or completion or interval might be different than what the DPORs require. However, that needs to be discussed. And, you know, again, the, you know, the program is a uh, living document. So, you know, everybody's welcome to change the TIO and add more intervals or milestone into it and requiring special VCR or the VCR for those milestones. So our field feels that I could grant you the uh, occupancy or substantial compliance for those areas and the user can start using those areas. And then before uh, I conclude, just to comment on what Rob say that the RFI, which is request for information or request for interpretation has been abused. So now all the changes, including material to change are, you know, are included in the RFI process. So what we are doing in the field is to ask the DPOR when responding to the RFI to self-declare if the response is a clarification, a non-material to change or material auto change. So many designers have made a box on that and the IOR is kind of screaming on that to see if there's any, uh, you know, omissions or, or I guess disagreement with that prior to presenting present it to field staff. But, uh, but many field staff are open that the DPO was submitting the RFI to the field staff directly. So to avoid, you know, uh, delay or constructions. However, that need to be self-declared first. So, you know, the field staff can concur with the non-material to change or not. And then the material to change, I would just suggest that as soon as you know it's a material to change, just provide an ACD for field staff to review so the construction will not be delayed. Great, thanks, James. We want to go ahead and take take this opportunity to thank everyone who has uh, joined us, who has uh, stuck with us this far. We're almost into an hour um, discussion, if you will. Um, we hope that you found the information uh, useful. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to email us at oshpd.fddisu 
at oshpod.ca.gov, as you see there on the screen. Also want to let you know that we have more interesting topics uh, for FBA 10s or Field Brief Advice 10s coming up, such as IOR notices, electrical installations, and a lot, lot more. So uh, if you haven't done so already, feel free to subscribe to Oshpod's mail, mail server uh, to receive notifications on, on up and coming webinars and FBA 10s and uh, more, more good info. So with that being said, we want to thank you again. And until next time, we want to thank you uh, for being here and for doing your part in providing access to safe quality health healthcare environments throughout the state of California. With that, uh, have enjoyed the rest of your day and uh, stay cool.